Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person, Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. This is our 25th year. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Albert Gary share his firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Albert, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Thank you. Albert, we have a lot for you to cover today, so we'll go ahead and get started. Albert, you were born in Paris, France in 1938. Before you tell us about what you and your family experienced during World War II and the Holocaust, will you share a bit about your parents, Benjamin and Claire? Yes, my parents were born in Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, they they grew up in Turkey and, and they left Turkey, they immigrated to France in 1923 after the First World War. And uh, the, the, when the, the Ottoman Empire was dismantled and then came a strong man by the name of Mustafa Kemal or Ataturk, which means father of modern Turkey. And uh, the Jews were frightened about, you know, what was in store for them with the, with this new uh, strong man. And, and my parents, both of them immigrated in 1923 to France. And uh, they met in 27 in Paris and they got married in 1928. Albert, you, you described your father to me, uh, your father Benjamin, as very smart but self-educated. Tell us, tell us about him. My father didn't go to school very long. Actually, he stopped. To, he started working at the age of ten or eleven, <laughs> and. Um, he was really self-educated. He learned from himself, from his own experiences. In 1923, he emigrated to France. He had an uncle in France, and he was hoping that his uncle would help him get started in life in, in, in France. But his uncle didn't pay too much attention to him, and he was very disillusioned about that, and eventually he had to manage by himself. He, he became an accountant, and he was hired by this garment factory, where he was doing the payroll of the, the staff, the personnel of the factory. And we were living in the garment factory house, uh, janitor house uh, at the entrance to the, the there was a long yard cobbled yard and i used to to go there i used to to play there with you know pulling a, a truck or something like that going to the workshops to see the the workers there mm -hmm. and i was like a mascot for them and albert Tell us a little bit about your mother, Claire. She was actually quite educated. My mother was more educated than my father. She went to the what they called at that time the Brevet Supérieur, which was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the equivalent of the baccalaureate. And uh, yeah, she was more educated than my father. My father was self-educated. And here we see a, a picture of your mother, I believe, at the beach, right? That's in uh, 1924, I think. Mm -hmm. She was at the beach. Yeah. Albert, also, please tell us about your sisters. Well, yeah, well, uh, 
my my parents met in 1927. They married in 28, and my, my sisters were born in 1930. Jacqueline and Gilbert in 1933. And I came five years later. I was, mm-hmm. but I lost my twin brother at the age of six months mm-hmm. of uh, uh, pneumonia. He's your twin brother. Yeah, my twin brother. Yeah, Albert, as you told us, your your father was an accountant, and you had a home as part of the garment factory. During that time, how would you describe your family's economic circumstances? Very modest. Very modest. Uh, we were living in the uh, janitor's apartment of the factory to save on the rent, I guess. And, uh, excuse me. Now, uh, there, before we continue, I'd like to let you know that there are people listening to you today and watching you from around the country and around the world. We have viewers today watching in Massachusetts, Texas, New Jersey, Nebraska, and Washington. And we also have international viewers in France, Brazil, Malta, the United Kingdom. So everybody's watching you today, welcome. Thank you. Albert, World War II began on September 1st, 1939, and the war came directly to you and your family in May, 1940, when Germany invaded France. You were nearly two years old when German troops advanced on Paris. Nearly 80% of Paris's population fled the city. Please tell us what you can about that time with, yeah. with what I think you call the Exodus. Yeah, we call it the Exodus. Yeah, the Exodus, actually. And um, yeah, the, the people of uh, Paris and northern France, when uh, France was invaded by uh, Germany, they fled south. And so did we, actually, my mother, my sisters, and I. My father stayed behind because he had to keep on working to make a living. But uh, with my mother and my sisters, we fled, and we ended up in Orléans, uh, a city on the River Loire. And uh, we spent one or a few nights, I don't know, in a chateau. Chateau de Ville Savin, uh, sleeping on the floor. Of course, there was nothing, and and uh, my mother had not much to feed me. So um, I was crying and disturbing the crowd. And at one point, I was crying all the time. And and uh, one of the uh, one of the soldiers, the one who was among the people who had fled, had a uh, bottle of uh, schnapps. He gave my mother a shot of schnapps, said, give give that to him, we'll see, maybe it will calm it down. And apparently it did. Mm. So I fell asleep. And, and Albert, as you were fleeing from Paris, along with hundreds of thousands of other Parisians leaving there in that mass exodus, Some of your family were tragically killed in that exodus, among them your maternal grandmother. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, my maternal grandmother had gone to to get some food for us. And there was, you know, there were attacks by the German and the Italian Air Force. And uh, she was killed by strafing. and uh, and also a bomb fell on the car where my uh, my mother had a brother and a sister and two nephews who, who were also f- running away from from the invasion and they were killed in the car and fortunately for you oh, and your immediate you know, we were struck by tragedy right away right away and as you explained to us, your father had stayed behind in Paris because he still had he, he needed to earn his living. And that's why he was doing that, right? Yeah. Okay. But not 
before too long, you returned back to Paris with your mother and your sisters. Why, why did you return to Paris under those circumstances? Well, you know, we didn't have anywhere else to go. Okay. We didn't have any relatives overseas or anything like that. So the only place where we could go was a home. So we went back home and um, and sure enough, in 1942, the, the collaborationist government uh, kicked us out of uh, the apartment that we were occupying in the uh, factory. And we had to find an apartment in no time, a, a two room apartment, not two bedroom, two room. Two room, a small kitchen and a toilet, that was it. And uh, I still remember the wallpaper on the on the walls, actually. That, and, and Albert, at that time that you were forced out of your apartment and had to go move into that much smaller place that you remember now, um, at that time, 1942, large-scale deportations, roundups and deportation of Jews were happening in France, or at least in Paris, right? Uh, already started, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and my father himself was taken away in uh, September 1943. And my mother found herself alone with three young children, terrified that at any moment they could come and take us away. Be before we come back to that, Albert, I'd like to just, if I could, I'd like to share a comment from a viewer who's watching today named Emma. Emma writes, I just wanted to say blessings to you and your family. I'm so sorry this happened to you. I'd also like to remind, uh, if I could, our audience to send your questions for Albert, and we're going to get to as many as we possibly can during this program. So as, as, as you began to tell us, Albert, in the fall of 1942, your parents uh, sent you to a home in the suburbs where they thought you might be safer. Will you tell us about that? Yeah, in uh, sep about September four, 1942, they sent us to a place called Toiry. It's a suburb of Paris on a farm. And uh, <clears throat> my sisters would go to school because they were older than me. Uh, they were five and eight years older than me. I was just uh, four years old at that time. And I stayed with the ladies. And um, and one day in the conversation, I was four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, one day in the conversation, I told the ladies that we were Jewish and they sent us right back home. So and up until that point, they did not know that. And then you just no. accidentally said it. No, my parents had not mentioned that for very good reasons. And when I, I came back home, my father took me aside and said, don't ever, ever say that you're Jewish. And that stayed with me for quite a few years, even after the war, mm -hmm. maybe until I was 15 or 16. So you're back in Paris. And then in September 1943, as you began to tell us, your father was taken by German authorities for forced labor to the Channel Islands between England and France. What can you tell us about your father being forced to leave and, and go do that forced labor? Well, my father was summoned to, to go to a, a small island called Aldonay, Origny in French. <coughs> uh, it was an English uh, uh, ch Channel Island. It was a uh, occupied by the Nazis at that point. And um, they were building what they called the Atlantic Wall, a uh, sort of a, a barrier uh, against any invasion from, from the Allies. And uh, my father had a, a terrible accident during that uh, stay in that uh, island. He fell off a cliff and he got badly injured on his head and he, he carried for the rest of his life a very heavy scars on his uh, brow here. 
do you, Albert, before that happened, do you remember your, yourself? Do you remember your father leaving for Alderney? Absolutely. I remember we all went to the, to the metro station with him. We walked to stay a little longer with him. And um, I remember my, my mother was, of course, crying. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand uh, why, but I uh, mean, uh, yeah. And uh, my father was to, to, to the metro and then he, he went to... Uh, to the uh, English Channel, and from there, they were sent to this island of Alderney where they were building fortifications. Mm -hmm. I, rem I remember you telling me that you even remember carrying his gas mask because he was required to take a gas mask with him. I was playing with this gas mask, actually. You're playing with a gas mask. Yeah. Putting it on, I, mm -hmm. I was four years old. Yeah. So. And, and as you said, he was severely injured because he fell off a cliff while doing labor there. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Albert, what, do you know if your mother was able to communicate with your father at that time? Uh, you know, for example, to, to learn about the, the injury that he sustained. Yes, she, she was able to exchange letters with, her, with him. I, I don't know how, but apparently... Uh, Yes, we knew that he had uh, this uh, terrible fall from a cliff. And, uh, and my mother thought that uh, we would ne never see him again, actually. But my father was very strong, much stronger than me, and he survived. And, and this photograph is a really important photograph. Will you tell us about it? This is a photograph that was taken. If we can see the the, the other side, yes, uh, that was a photograph that my mother took us to a photographer because we didn't have any camera in those days. You know, camera it was a luxury item. So uh, we went to a photographer, and we had this picture taken, and we sent it to my father. Uh, very affectionate uh, memory to our uh, dad, uh, husband, uh, da, uh, dear husband, signed Claire, Jacqueline, Gilbert, and Albert. And, and, and what's the date on that uh, card or that photo? January, uh, January 11, 1944. Uh, uh, what, a, what, a, what an item for you still to have after all these years. I know that's uh, obviously very precious to you. Um, before we go on, Albert, I'd like to remind our audience, please share any questions that you have with Albert, and we will get to as many of those as we can. So, as you said, once your father was gone uh, to do this forced labor, here your mother was alone with three children, fearing for your, your lives, all four of you. Uh, and it wasn't long before she met a woman uh, at a street market that she felt she could trust what happened when your mother uh, met Madame Gallo? Yes, you know, uh, you had two kinds of people among the French people in those days. You had the sympathizers of the collaborationists and the Nazis, and the people who were resenting the occupation and the deprivation of uh, rights and, and all these things. And uh, Madame Gallo was in the second category, actually. and. And my mother felt that she could open up to her, and she, she told her that she was terrified that at any moment they could come and take us away. And Madame Gallo was moved by my, my mother's story. She went to her husband, she told her husband, and her husband came to us, Monsieur Gallo, the next day, and we took whatever personal effects we could and we went to live with the Gallo family, where we stayed for about six months. What What can you tell us about what life was like for you living with the Gallo family? So they, they literally opened up their home and said, I'll bring all four of you into our home. To me, it was the happiest time during the war. I had two playmates, their two daughters, Janine and Mireille, who were uh, four and three, I was five, 
and um, and we had the great hide and seek. You know, Monsieur Gallo was working on the movie studios, and they had a warehouse behind their house where they were storing all the sets for the movies. And we had great hide and seek uh, games in this uh, warehouse. Uh, for me, it was a happy time. Mm. You know, what did I know about the war? Right. I didn't realize I was just a kid. You, 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 you shared with me that the gallows were, despite the danger you were in, they were, they did all they could to make you feel comfortable. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Monsieur Gallo made us some toys for Christmas, uh, uh, small trunks like uh, piggy banks in the shape of a trunk that he painted. And uh, we had one for each one of us. And they, they, they were wonderful. He was telling us stories, you know, uh, taking a big voice at once upon a time. And, and, uh, and we were, you know, drinking his words, actually. And, and Albert, of course, as you said, that was probably the happiest time of the war for you. But your mother and, of course, your sisters were older than you, so they were most likely far more aware of the dangers and were constantly afraid. Do you know what that time was like for them? Well, my sisters were also, you know, they were much more traumatized than I ever was. I was never really traumatized because I was too young to realize the danger. I, I, I believe this photo was taken uh, while you were with the gallows. Yes, and while uh, my father was in captivity, it was in the Jardin du Luxembourg in Paris. There was a photographer who took a picture. And, um, Albert, going back a moment, uh, your mother approached Mrs. Gallo, a stranger, a complete stranger in a market, and opened up to her. Do you do you have any idea what would have motivated your mother to to take that risk and and approach Mrs. Gallo? Probably she had it on her chest, and uh, it had to come out uh, somehow. I, I guess I don't know. Uh, yeah was not there but an amazing amazing thing for her to do and for the gallows i'm assuming that there was a considerable risk to them for having you in their home if they had been reported not only would we have been deported but that probably it would have been the same for them and their, and their children mm -hmm. it was very dangerous and you had we were living in a street about 10 houses, I would say. And among uh, the neighbors, there was a lady who was a sympathizer of the Nazis, who one day told uh, Mrs. Gallo, when are you going to get rid of that scum? We were the scum. Mm. So at that point, my mother and Madame Gallo thought it might be uh, safer for us to go back home and that's what we did. So somehow this neighbor suspected that you were um, Jew, Jewish. Jews, uh, hidden Jews. Yeah. Uh, hidden with the Gallo family. Yes. We have a question. Yeah, I don't know people. what motivated uh, the, the Gallo family was a Protestant family. They were very uh, observant Protestant. And they, they were part of a church. And whether it had anything to do, any connection with the church, but somehow they um, they decided to take us into hiding. They were Albert. heroes. To me, they were heroes. Yes. Uh, Albert, we have a question uh, um, from one of our viewers named Cor, and she asks, um, are you still in touch with any of the family members of the Gallows? Or were, I'll add, were you in touch with any of them after the war? Uh, we were in touch with them after the war, but eventually, you know, uh, I moved. I, you know, I went to I went to Africa. I went to Canada. I, I came to the states, and I lost track. Mm -hmm. 
But one day, I think it was around 1990 or 91, I looked up in the phone book, in the Minitel, they call it the Minitel, it's a smaller uh, computer, uh, computerized uh, phone book, and I found uh, Madame Gallo, and I called her. I said, Madame Gallo, Emmy Gallo, yes. Are you the widow of Gabriel Gallo? Yes, well, I am Albert Gary. And I said, wow. no, hello, I promise, I, I, am, I, I live in the States right now, and I'm going home in the next few days, but I promise next time I come to France, I will come to see you. And I, I came back about six months later, and I went, she, they were they had settled in the south of France, in Montpellier, near Montpellier, and uh, I went to see her. I spent two days with her, and that was wonderful. That, that had to have been wonderful. Yes, it yeah, was. Thanks for, thanks for letting us know about that, Albert. So, once this person basically told the gallows that you needed to leave. Um, where did you go from there? We went back home. We had no choice. We had nowhere else to go. My father was in captivity, and uh, we had we had to we had to go back home. We had no other place to. Go. And and I, as I understand it, you weren't at home back in your home very long when police inspectors came to your home. Maybe um, uh, a couple of months later, with the visit of two police inspector. Madame, it was like at seven o'clock in the morning, actually, I was still in bed. I was uh, awakened by the commotion. And uh, Madame Gary, we came to take you away. That's what, what my mother had dreaded all along. So she started shaking, of course. And uh, the inspectors, for whatever reason, it was uh, it was around D Day, more or less. Maybe they felt that the, the war was lost for them. They told my mother, "We're going to report. We didn't find you, but you must not sleep in your bed tonight." So uh, my mother dressed me very quickly. It was seven o'clock in the morning, and uh, with my sisters, we went to see a social worker to explain the situation. And the social worker said, and I need at least a couple of days to find a place for each one of you. In the meantime, try to see if you can stay with your neighbors. And that's what we did. And our neighbors, the Ménétrier and the other neighbors, they, they opened their doors and said, you're welcome with, to stay with us. There's no problem. And the, our neighbors were wonderful, wonderful. And um, so we stayed with the, with the Ménétrier for a couple of days until the social worker came back and uh, told my, my mother, Ma'am Gary, we found a place for each one of you. Before you, before you go to that, Albert, let me just ask you, the, the Minitrees, where you were you able to stay with them for those few days, they also uh, were living illegally in the eyes of the occupation force, right? Yeah, uh, Robert Minitrier had been summoned to mandatory labor service in Germany, like uh, all the French men of uh, age, uh, active age, actually and he had not reported for duty. So he was also wanted by the Gestapo. <clears throat> so, uh, yes? I, I was just to say, I find that uh, remarkable here. Your mom has to leave and take you with her, go into hiding with somebody else who's also being sought, but they gave you shelter anyway. Yep. Yeah. No, uh, it was years of living dangerously. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So um, your, your mother, your mother, the social worker helps you to find find your mother a job as a governess for a Parisian family, 
and you and your sisters were placed in separate boarding schools in a suburb of Paris, Montfermé. So now this is the first time that you yourself are without any of your family members. What, yeah. what do you know of what that was like for you? Well, I was six years old, but I was very uh, privileged that the headmistress was really taking good care of me. I was like a protégé and she was always holding my hand and making sure that I was safe or all that, you know. She was, she was really looking after me. And my great regret is that I was too young and I never bothered to ask for her name because I would have loved to have her recognized as a righteous among the nations. Mm. And I was never able to find out. Mm. Albert, do you, do you think your mother, do you know if your mother knew where you and your sisters had been placed after you all went separate ways? Yes, yes, she, she knew exactly where we were, but she could not communicate with us. She could not write, she could, you know, there was no phone, uh, of course. And uh, so uh, she, for about two, three months, she was without any communication with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she was taking care of a family with eight or 10 children. What, what what were conditions like for you in this place? I know that you were well taken care of by the, the governess there, but um, what do you, do you recall what the food circumstances, conditions were like for you? We were constantly hungry, mm -hmm. constantly hungry. And uh, I remember when my mother finally, when Paris was liberated, you know, uh, in the... September 1944, Paris was liberated. We were liberated two days later because we were east of Paris. And um, as soon as the train service was restored, my mother came to see us. And she was appalled by how skinny and uh, in bad shape I looked. I, I, I know about me. I don't know so much about my sisters but it must not have been any better, actually. Mm -hmm. Bef before we talk about liberation, um, Albert, do you think anybody um, knew that you were Jewish at the boarding school? No, I may have, probably the headmistress. But, but the, nobody else, yeah. The one who took me into hiding, and I was uh, like a protégé, and she was always looking after me, taking good care of me. And uh, when we were liberated, she was holding my hand and uh, she was a, a surrogate mother for me. And Albert, as you, as you started to tell us in, in August, 1944, you're just six years old and you were liberated while in this boarding school. What, what, do, you, what do you recall about liberation? What, what, what do you remember that was like? I remember vividly. Uh, there was a kid from the school who had left who came back saying, the Allies are coming, the Allies are coming. So we all went on the main street and we saw the trucks, the jeeps, the tanks, soldiers with a different helmet. And it was the first time I ever heard of Americans. I had heard about English, Germans, Italians, Russians, Americans, where do they come from? And uh, if I had been told that one day I would be American myself, I wouldn't have believed it. That, that, that's just really remarkable that, for you to share that with us. You'd never even heard of Americans and no. here they were. Who are these guys? Where do they come from? <laughs> Albert, tell us what it was like for you then now to reunite with your mother and your sisters. Well, as soon as uh, Paris was liberated and uh, so was Montfermé two days later, my mother was on the first train. And one day I see my sisters, we were, you know, playing in the playground. There's, it was summer, so there was no school. Mm -hmm. We were staying in, in the playground 
And one day I see my sisters and they said, guess who's here? I had no idea who, who had come to see us. But when I saw my mother, I jumped into her arms. And, but she was appalled by how I looked. Mm -hmm. I was very skinny and, uh, and she decided to take me home the same day. And she went back the next day to pick up my sisters. So very quickly, she had everybody, her children, all with her. Albert, I'd like to uh, share a question we have from a viewer named Trinity. And Trinity's question is, what was the scariest moment for you when you were in hiding? Uh, there must have been a lot of scary mo moments. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how scary it was because I was too young to realize the danger. But I know that uh, once, for instance, my mother had to run an errand and she took me along uh, and we took the subway to go to Paris. And when we came back, there was an identity check. And, uh, that, that my, of course, my mother, like every Jew, had a J on her identity card, which meant that, that if she had shown her card to one of the militia or police or whatever, uh, I wouldn't be here today. We would have been put aside and then sent to Drancy, which was a transit camp and from there probably to Auschwitz. So uh, she took me into her arms. She pretended to look into a purse. She walked between two uh, militias and they didn't stop her. If mm -hmm. one, one of the militias had said, ma'am, I haven't seen your papers, I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that. And, and, yeah, just, just really luck in that sense, right? Yeah. Albert, we also have, um, uh, another question and a comment from Lisa, and um, oh no, I'm going to come back to Lisa's question if you don't mind in a minute. You you were you were not just really skinny and hungry; you were starving. What what was done to help you restore your health? Well, when my mother came, she you know everything was rationed during the war, even bread. So uh, she had ration tickets. She bought a loaf of bread and we swallowed it in no time. We, that's how hungry we were. And, and when, she, when she came, when she took me back home, the next day she left me under the custody of Madame Minitrier, our next door neighbor. And there was one green apple in the house, which was the worst food I could have eaten during that time. And um, at one point, my military with the key opened the door to, to our apartment and she, said, and she saw me touching my teeth like that and said, did you eat something? And, oh. <laughs> and uh, of course I had eaten a green apple, which was very bad, very bad. But anyway, that's how hungry I was. Yeah. And Albert, you uh, you had shared with me that one of the things is part of the treatment you were fed castor oil, and for people like myself of a certain cod age, liver, you, cod liver oil, yes, cod liver. I'm mean, cod liver oil, and for cod people, oil, you, and uh, I I was drinking it, you know. With, I think I, I think I can say you're the only person I've ever talked to who said they like the cod liver oil. To say that I. I liked it, I don't know, but I, I drank it uh, with appetite, actually. I needed that. Yeah. And I had an ex uh, uh, um, V ray. Uh, oh, UV, UV treatment? UV, UV rays, yes. Yes. And because um, I was uh, really skinny. Albert, we have another question. This one's from Lisa. And Lisa says, thank you for sharing your story. Did you get to reunite with your father? Yes, actually. My father 
uh, when the the Allies landed in Normandy, uh, the Allies moved the, the 900 inmates uh, from uh, where they were on the uh, on the coast of uh, English Channel. They moved them to the Strait of Dover, which is the shortest distance between France and Great Britain. And they were repairing the fortification that had been demolished by uh, the bombardments. And uh, at one point, the Germans put the nine, there were 900 inmates. They put them on a train bound for Germany, probably to a death camp or something like that. And, um, and the train was stopped in Belgium by partisans. There was a battle. The German released the 900 inmates, and my father walked back from Belgium to Paris. He arrived the morning of Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. And my mother was dressing me to go to synagogue for the first time. And there was a knock on the door. We knew that he was on his way because uh, one of his cousins had been released also, he was with him, and uh, and he had told us that, that he was on his way. So we were expecting him any moment, but we didn't know exactly when. And he arrived the morning of Rosh Hashanah. Hmm. Albert, just so I make sure I understand, and our audience does, so the, the Germans took them and we were going to send them to Germany, the train was attacked by partisans. They were released, and then he walked from Belgium back to to Paris. How how far roughly are we talking about? about Two hundred mile trek, I would say, like New York to Washington. Uh -huh. So he makes it back. Uh, you you'd gotten word that he was coming back. What what do you remember about his arrival? I remember vividly. Actually, my mother was dressing me to go to see yeah. him for the first time, and there was a knock on the door. It was my father. He arrived there in the morning of Rosh Hashanah. So we were reunited. Our nuclear family was uh, safe. Uh, my mother had lost a brother, a sister, a mother, a nephews in bombardments. Uh, some of our cousins also were deported and never came back. But our nuclear family was intact. My mother, my father, my sisters and me. After all your father had gone through um, that serious injury that you described to us um, and walking back by foot 200 miles to get to you, what kind of condition was your father in? Very bad. You can see on his head the scars that is fall from a, a cliff. He fell off a cliff where he was carrying a trough of cement. He stepped on a loose board, and the board came to hit him like this, and uh, and he fell off a cliff, and he was sewn, you know, with whatever means that were available at that time. And you can see the deep scars he has. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a major scar on his head. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Albert, we, we, we have a video question from a student for you, Isabella, um, who is asking about your father. So let's, let's go ahead and hear directly from Isabella. Hi, I'm Isabella Walsh, and I'm from Glisby High School in Glisby, Illinois, and I'm here to ask you a question. Did you and him ever talk about your experiences and his experiences? Asking you, Albert, is did you and your father ever talk about your experiences and his experiences? Did you talk together about those? Maybe at one point uh, when he came back, but uh, then, uh, you know, we moved on. Uh, we were not always speaking about this experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I'm speaking a lot about, about right. that. But at that time you weren't, yeah. No. Albert, your your mother must have felt just tremendous relief once your father returned and all her children were safely back with them. Did she ever talk to you about what the stress of protecting you and your sister sisters from constant threats was like for her? 
Not really, but uh, I know that uh, you know she was in constant fear during the war. And after the war, she had a bad reaction. She had an abscess on her shoulder here, which was all the bad blood that you know she had uh, had during that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was hospitalized and uh, with a, a very big abscess on the, on her shoulder. Mm. Albert, when you were liberated, August 1944, and uh, the war was far from over, however, in the rest of Europe. The war would not end to the following May of 1945. Do you know if your parents felt truly safe during those first months after liberation of Paris? I think so. I think so. You know, uh, as soon as Paris was liberated, life resumed normally you know, for us. October 1st was back to school day. Mm -hmm. I was six years old. I was eager to go to school. I was very happy. And yeah, Yeah. life was back to normal at last. Tell us about this photograph. This photograph was taken at the school. We, you know, we didn't have any camera or anything like that was the school who took this picture. I, li- I like it. <laughs> I, I, I love this photograph of you, absolutely. Uh, Albert, I just, I have one more question for you today, and that is, please tell us what we can learn, what we need to learn from your firsthand account of the Holocaust. I think we have to we have to fight constantly we have to be constantly aware of the dangers of hatred bigotry fanaticism anti-semitism hate we have to be constantly aware and that's one of the reasons why i'm active at the museum because i want to spread the word about the dangers of all these uh, uh, scourges. Albert, I've I've had the privilege of um, getting to know you and and hearing you share what you can about what you experienced for for about 12 years now. And um, I'm just, I know I can speak on behalf of anybody who listens to you that we are so grateful that you take the time um, to do this and continue to do this. And I hope you're able to continue to share what you experienced because audiences need to hear it for a very long time. Um, let me also share with you before we close, Albert, a comment from the audience. Um, thank you, Albert. The experiences that survivors like you have shared throughout the years have shaped me, my attitude and decisions today and my determination to fight anti-Semitism. That's uh, that's the justification of my action, actually. Yes. Well, thank you so much for that, Albert. And thank, thank you for being our first person today. Thank you. I'd like to thank our, take a moment to thank our donor. First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I'd also like to invite you to join us next month for another first-person program. Thanks for being with us today. Bye-bye.